G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. It is Derby week ahead of Western Derby 54. Uh, so I thought, uh, keeping with recent tradition that we've been doing on the channel, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a preview to this game. And I think uh, normally Drewsy and I would do a, a little you know, preview video together. Usually when uh, the Eagles are the home team, it'd be a video on my channel. Uh, when Freo hosts uh, last year, what we did was Drewsy did a preview on his channel. But Drewsy, unfortunately, is out of action at the moment. He's a bit unwell and uh, yeah, couldn't, uh, can't quite get in the same room together. So I thought I'd just have a crack at making my own video uh, about what I think about this upcoming derby. And I think it's fair to say this is one of the most bizarre lead ups to a derby I think we've ever seen. I think I said that last year in the second derby, but this year even more so because there seems to be an absolute sort of deflated build up to this Western derby. I don't think, you know, either set of fans are really keen to, to sort of build up for this one. On, on both sides, there's a lot of pessimism going into this game for different reasons. A big part of that is uh, obviously this this COVID situation that's still ripping through West Coast. This is the third week in a row where we're going to have nowhere near, you know, our best available team. Part of that's injury, but most of that is COVID at the moment. You know, we, we all know about it. We had 14 changes last week and potentially 15. So we're going to break the record we uh, we set last week with potentially 15 changes this week. And obviously West Coast have gone down to the Gold Coast Suns in Perth and then North Melbourne. There's obviously a huge amount of doubt that the Eagles are going to be able to field a 22 on the field who are, you know, able to win this game. On the Fremantle side of things, I think uh, I can say anecdotally, this is probably the most negative I've heard or seen Fremantle fans on their own team for some time. And, and to be honest, the bar for that is pretty high. I guess the context, you know, for their season, how that's going is, um, you know, there's a lot of optimism from Fremantle fans who thought, you know, this is the year they're going to emerge from the shadows, you know, stop being a rebuilding team. I think this is the seventh year of their rebuild now. And it's time to get cracking. It's time to win the games they should win and accumulate enough wins to, to play finals this year. That was the expectation, I think, from a lot of Freo fans this year. And to be honest, I kind of bought into that a little bit. I was thinking thinking Fremantle are a good chance to play finals this year. And it's too early to go back on that. Obviously, we're only, you know, we've seen two rounds so far. But I think the, the level of football that Fremantle fans were expecting uh, certainly hasn't been reached on field just yet. So in round one, they played really well in the first half against Adelaide, completely went to sleep in the third quarter to such an extent that a rebuilding side like Adelaide clawed them back. And uh, with not too long to go, I think Adelaide were actually in front and Fremantle had to kick a goal through, I think, Schultz. And then a desperate, you know, spoil on the goal line in the dying seconds eventually gave Fremantle a one-point win. But the mood from Frio fans, other than, you know, worshipping Chapman's great defensive effort, which it was, was a bit somber, to be honest. They kind of felt like maybe it was one they could shake off and it was one to maybe not reflect too much on. But unfortunately, the, the third quarter version of Fremantle from that game is what carried into round two against St Kilda after a fairly bright start, even though St Kilda probably had, you know, a bit more of the ball from memory, a few more inside 50s. Fremantle just looked a bit sharper. But after, you know, particularly the second quarter, they completely died off. You know, I've talked about this in my uh, in my my thoughts on round two video, so I don't I don't need to sort of rehash all of that. But ultimately, Fremantle have just looked very very disappointing. Not just in the eyes of their fans. I think Lee Matthews came out and said they've been the most disappointing team this year. I mean, in my eyes as well, I expected a much better brand of footy so far. But it is only early, so we can't write them off just yet. But they've definitely got their work cut out for them. You know, we've gone from the situation at the start of the year where Fremantle fans would, would have thought, you know, even with completely fit lists, Fremantle would be much better than West Coast this year. And the reality is at the moment, you know, some of them are not even convinced they're going to beat this top upside. You know, an actual Fremantle fan could probably give you some better diagnostics on what's going wrong. It looks like in the midfield, Andy Brayshaw was playing a bit of a lone hand. He was an absolute monster, possibly his best game for the club, or at least one of the most animalistic performances I've seen from him in his career, having 40 touches. But no Fife, no Mundy. Mundy was a big part of their midfield last year, let's not forget. I know Fife has played a bit more forward in recent times. Caleb Sarong, I think, has been hampered by a knee injury, which would explain his slow start to the season. And then, of course, you know, the, the thing we can't forget, Adam Chera was actually a key part of that midfield last year as well, and he's gone. And the replacement for that, Will Brody, has been solid, but ultimately it just hasn't been enough to bridge the gap for Fremantle. Sean Darcy is probably one of their best players and he copped an untimely injury last week and maybe coincidentally, maybe not, that was sort of when St Kilda started really getting a hold of their opportunities and eventually would go on to win the game. But for me, the, the midfield looks a little bit light on and generating scoring opportunities and of course we all know that their forward line isn't really the most efficient at you know converting those opportunities. Not great in front of goal and you know their forward line has consisted of, of a few good players but none of them are, are genuinely consistently productive forwards. Walters is the exception to that, 
although it's been a while since he's been at his goal kicking best. Relying a little bit on Rory Lobb, of course, but again, not a massively proven goal kicker. Matt Tabner has had a few good seasons. He is a good player. I'm a huge fan of what guys like Schultz and Switkowski are doing in that forward line, but again, as good as they are, they don't bag a lot of goals. They're more like creative smalls who add a lot of pressure, and Switkowski in particular does an amazing job of getting out of trouble sometimes. He's quite a mercurial player, but I think that's what's letting them down. It's, first of all, the midfield not producing enough, and then the, the forwards not really being good enough or you know maybe not confident enough right now. Maybe they're just out of form to really put any opportunities they have on the scoreboard. And this is what's frustrating as an Eagles fan because I look at Fremantle right now and I think, you know, they're beatable. Like I actually think we could still be better than Fremantle right now. But it may be a completely redundant point when you look at you know the, the omissions we're going to have this week as well. Willy Rioli played one of his best games for the club last week uh, as playing as a you know a half forward rolling through the midfield. Kicks four, has something like 18 touches or something like that. Boom, COVID, out for the game. Luke Shuey has a pretty respectable return game and while he maybe not accumulated as much as he would normally would, uh, he, did, he used the ball well, didn't make mistakes and was really an important part of that midfield. On top of that, you got Bailey Williams, uh, second ruck who was pretty much number one ruck last week. Jack Williams, the debutant, not a huge loss, obviously. He's still a pretty raw player. Tim Kelly's done a hamstring as well, so he's not even available. So despite, you know, the, the really spirited effort from the Eagles last week and the optimism, you know, when we get these players back, uh, that's when we'll start playing some good footy. But once again, we're hit by this revolving door of COVID. Then, you know, combined with Tim Kelly's injury, we're going to be fielding an really, really weak midfield this week. Now, it's hard to get really stuck into to team analysis because uh, they've, you know, pushed back the announcement of the teams this week to, to later this afternoon. By the time this video comes out, it might, may already be out, I'm not sure. But we have got those outs I've mentioned confirmed. And there's a chance that a lot of the ins that were scheduled to come back this week after the health and safety protocols ended, there's a chance that some of them don't get up because, you know, I think Tom Barras was an example. He's still got symptoms and he's, you know, it, I'd imagine it'd be very hard to play with COVID, you know. We saw Tim Kelly die off really hard last week. He had a really good first half but obviously when you when you've just had a, a virus that sort of targets the lungs you can understand why some of these players are not fit to run out four quarters so just looking at some of the you know the projected mock teams uh for for today based on what we know starting midfield consists of jack redden Andrew Gaff as the only, you know, recognized actual midfielders, and ideally Gaff's a wingman anyway. After that, you got Jermaine Jones, who played an amazing game in round one, in my opinion, in terms of, you know, what we expected from him. He, he showed a lot of promise. Petrovsky Seaton, a guy who uh, probably hasn't proven himself as a full-time midfielder yet, and again, another one coming back from injury. Then the only other recognized midfielder that I can see on this list is Luke Edwards, who, uh, who I really like as a player, but wasn't supposed to play AFL last week, but was meant to come through back through the waffle because he's coming back from a groin injury. Played 53 minutes. It's probably more than he, he should have played. He's probably going to have to be, you know, a, a first rotation midfielder in this game. We played some players that were just genuinely not ready last week. One of them was Callum Jamison, who, you know, can't blame the kid. He's just not quite ready for AFL. He's probably going to have to play again in this game. The back line that we pick, hopefully, uh, is going to be relatively settled. You've still got Harry Edwards, McGovern, Rotham in there, Hearns hopefully playing, Withered and Foley. So these guys are maybe not not you know the, the first six pick but it's not far off the final product equally in the forward line we finally got jk and darling playing and uh, and waterman as well so we've got three tall targets up there hugh dixon probably second ruck and liam ryan and petricelli so not too far off the best although some big names still missing but it's the midfield it's nick nat in an ideal world is playing but he's no guarantee even if he's you know winning the, the ruck taps which is no guarantee sean darcy is a very good player and probably playing it's the midfield of, of gaff redden jermaine jones luke edwards that uh, that i think could ultimately cost us this game. But we can't control that. We can't control that, unfortunately. And it's just uh, it's just a strange feeling. I, I think the mood at West Coast is relatively good. I, um, Simpson came out and said in his press conference yesterday that uh, he made a comment that he was he's full of energy at the moment, which is great. And it, it must be nice to be in a position where the pressure's taken off you a little bit. There's no expectation on what, um, what this Eagles side is going to deliver. I've been making comments in recent years where... Going to Eagles home games hasn't been that fun lately. And the reason is because we're expected to win every game. So if we're playing, you know, St Kilda, we're playing the Crows in Perth, the pass mark to five goal win. It doesn't make it that fun. Do you know what I mean? But now, you know, we've got some adversity thrust upon us and it's an exciting position to be in, in a sense, because we're sort of giving a lot of opportunity to some, to some younger guys. And frankly, we we need to do that. So hopefully what we can take out of this is some really good experiences for the younger guys. Unfortunately, some of the younger guys I want to see are also out with injury, but you know, Brady Hoff's going to be playing Luke Foley. Patrick Nash, uh, I think has a future at AFL level as well. Jermaine Jones showed that he could probably be a pretty good AFL player as well. So 
there's a handful of guys that I'm really excited to see. But ultimately, there's a, there's a deflating feeling now. Of the first month of the season was meant to be a relatively easy run of fixtures. Gold Coast, North Melbourne, Fremantle, who I think if we had fit teams against, we should have won all those games. The Pies obviously finished bottom four last year. They're playing like they would probably beat us anyway. So what should have been, you know, a 3-1 and one opening month or potentially 4-0, and oh, depending on how well we went, I know that's optimistic. It's almost going to be guaranteed 0-5 at this point. And while I understand the circumstances, I accept them, uh, it's still a little bit deflating that this season could potentially get away from us uh, before it even starts. And I certainly wouldn't say that I hope other teams go through COVID challenges because ultimately we just, we want people to be healthy, right? I'm not, I don't wish COVID on anyone. But on the other hand, there's a, a, there's a part of me obviously that doesn't want to be the only team that's been severely disadvantaged uh, throughout the season. So we'll just have to see what happens, cop the reality of it. People are calling for an Eagles rebuild. Maybe this is the year that we get forced into a draft pick that um, you know we probably doesn't reflect how good we are. Maybe we take out of this year you know, a lot of experience for the younger guys, whilst some of our veterans still have a few years left and maybe a top five pick to boot as well. But anyway, I'm rambling about the Eagles now. Uh, just a comment on the game. I can't imagine a scenario where West Coast win this game. I hate to say it because I had tipped us. This is the third week in a row. I've tipped this in my video. And unfortunately, it's the third week in a row. I'm going to have to change my tip right before the game. I think Fremantle will live for this contest. I think we will be up for the fight. But ultimately, we just won't have the cattle to unfortunately topple them. But tell you what, if Fremantle lose this game, that is terrible. I should highlight as well, Fremantle do have, you know, a couple of COVID cases themselves. I think Monday, maybe last week or this week, I'm not too sure. Pretty sure he's unavailable. And of course, Justin Longmuir, the coach, uh, is missing through health and safety protocols as well. But that's not enough to sway my tip because, frankly, you know, we've seen coaches miss in the past. In fact, almost every time that I've seen the, the head coach miss the game, the uh, the assistant coach has stepped up and they've won the game anyway. So I'm going to have to tip Fremantle by a healthy 55 points, to be honest. I know that sounds really negative, but I just can't see us running out this game for four quarters and hopefully we put up a good fight. I'll be in attendance, uh, take my friend Callum along. I would love a win but I just cannot get my hopes up for this one. Anyway, guys, let me know in the comments what you uh, agreed and disagreed with, who's your tip, and uh, we'll, we'll do a Ross Glendening Allen medal prediction. I'm going to say Brayshaw. He's an absolute gun of a player. Thanks, guys. I'll see you later.